We're in the book of Kings, 2 Kings, and uh, 2 Kings has really been a pretty sad story uh, so far. There's a lot of judgment, and in the middle of all this judgment, we probably need a little bit of hope regarding God's promises of mercy, and we find that hope in 2 Kings chapter 11. It doesn't start out great, though, because when Athaliah, who was the mother of Ahaziah, saw that he had died, she seizes the opportunity to set herself up as queen. Now, you have to remember that we've moved from Israel to Judah here. So we're talking about the descendants of David, and they, of course, are significant because they represent God's great promise of a future eternal king. And yet at this point, these descendants aren't doing so well. When Athaliah's husband became king, he had killed all his brothers. Then her son Ahaziah dies, and then 42 of his relatives as well. But in spite of all of this killing of David's descendants, there still seemed to be some left, and Athaliah tries to kill them as well. What does she do in chapter 11, verse 1? Now, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal family. And yet as she's raging against God's promise, God's making a plan to keep that promise moving forward. And he uses one of Ahaziah's sisters to do it. All of David's descendants are basically dead at this point, except for one little baby. And Jehosheba races to rescue him, and she hides him and nurses him in a bedroom, keeping him safe for six years. Now, we just we need to see how huge this moment was. Why is this action so important? It's important because this little baby represents all that is left of the Davidic line. It's important because the Davidic line is our hope for God reversing the curse. God has made a promise to the descendants of David. And so if this little baby's gone, our hope is gone. Now, Jehosheba is not the only hero we meet in the story. She's a hero. She rescues this baby. But there's also Jehoiada. While Athaliah doesn't know that this baby, whose name is Joash, is alive, this faithful priest somehow does, and he makes, him a, he makes a plan to establish him as king on his seventh birthday. Crazy enough, when Athaliah hears of this, she tears her clothes and cries out, Treason! Treason! We can be so blind, can't we? Jehoiada doesn't only want to set the proper king on his throne, however. He wants God's people to return to him. So in verse 17, we read that he made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people that they should be the Lord's people and also between the king and his people. And really, probably what he's doing is just renewing the covenant that had been made with God all those years before. And from there, he acts in accordance with the covenant calling on the people to rid themselves of idolatry, which, which they do. Then all the people of the land went to the house of Baal and tore it down. His altars and his images they broke in pieces, and they killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars, which shows how wicked Athaliah was. She has brought Baal worship all the way down to Judah. While this story started out looking pretty hopeless, with this pagan Baal worshiper ascending to the throne, almost having killed all of David's descendants, we see God working, in a sense, behind the scenes through an auntie and through a priest to rescue a little baby, raise him up, and set him on the throne, even cleansing the nation of its idolatrous worship as they do so. And so we're wondering at the beginning of chapter 12, how Joash will do as a king. Is this the beginning of something great? And remember, we're always looking for the man who can pick up the Davidic covenant and, and be that great Davidic king who will rule over God's people the way God desires. And so we wonder if Joash is the one, and yet the writer doesn't leave us wondering very long. He summarizes Joash's reign in verse 2. He says, Jehoash, which is an alternate spelling, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord because all his days, because Jehoiada the priest instructed him, 
Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people continued to sacrifice and make offerings on the high places, which is mostly positive, but it does leave us with some questions in that it says he did what was right because Jehoiada the priest instructed him. And so you're wondering, did this come from his heart? Was this simply external conformity? And I suppose if that's all we had, then we wouldn't have much. But the next statement is telling as well. He didn't obey completely. He didn't take away the high places. And that becomes even more clear when you turn over to the book of Chronicles, because in Chronicles we read in chapter 24, verse 17, after the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. Then the king listened to them, and they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served the ashram and the idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this guilt of theirs. Yet he sent prophets among them to bring them back to the Lord. These testified against them, but they would not pay attention. So Joash did well as long as Jehoiada was alive. And then once he died, he went back to idolatry. At the same time, while that's sad, we should take this start for what it is. And it is encouraging, especially after what we've seen of Ahaziah and the others. There's at least a little bit of hope. Here's a king who is doing what's right. And one area that he definitely takes great strides forward in is in regard to the house of the Lord. Apparently, he came up with a plan to gather funds to repair the temple. The priests then were to use these funds to do the work that was needed. But for some reason or another, they never seemed to get around to it. So he tells the priests that they need to stop taking money and that he's going to find another way to get the repairs done. They make this box where the people could put money in that they wanted specifically to use for the building of the temple, which made things easier and that the money was getting mixed up what was going for the temple now would go straight to the temple instead of some of it for the priests some of it for other things and when they received the necessary money in this box they then used that to repair the house of the lord but they didn't use it to make utensils or anything like that for the temple only for repairs in spite of this great work that we're reading about here and all that joash did to repair the temple when he was pressed up against the wall, he compromised and really undid everything that he had been seeking to accomplish. The writer of Kings tells us, At that time, Haziel, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. But when Haziel set his face to go up against Jerusalem, Jehoash, king of Judah, took all the sacred gifts that Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah's fathers, the king of Judah, had dedicated in his own sacred gifts and all the gold that was found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent these to Haziel, king of Syria, Syria, then Haziel went away from Jerusalem. And one of the, the big things you see all throughout the book of Kings is that in times of trouble, these kings don't trust God. They trust some sort of political maneuvering. And it seems to work for a little while, but in the end, it always ends up destroying uh, the people. And, and it definitely, we see the judgment that God brought on Joash as a result because after this Joash is killed by his own servants which is kind of a letdown. It all started in this really exciting way with God rescuing Joash and establishing him as king and getting rid of the idolatry in Judah and even him trying to repair the temple and then when push comes to shove we find him compromising and being killed and I think it really makes us long for a king who won't disappoint. We've been disappointed by so many kings with man being so wicked, how can God keep his promise? If we're ever concerned about the state of God's promise in the face of man's wickedness, we need to step back and look carefully again at the character of God. And the writer helps us do that in chapter 13. First, we see God keeping his promise to Jehu. He told Jehu he would have children on the throne until the fourth generation. And here's the first of those children. In the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, and he reigned for 17 years. Now, unsurprisingly, he's wicked. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And unsurprisingly, this makes God angry. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them continually into the hand of Hazel, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazel. What is surprising, though, is what happens in verse 4, because what does this king of Israel, Jehoaz, do? It says, Then Jehoaz sought the favor of the Lord, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, how the king of Syria oppressed them. And so here's a wicked man, 
in trouble. And what does he do? He does what wicked men sometimes do when they're in trouble. Finally, they go to God and ask for help. Now, how would we respond to someone who was asking us for help like this? I think we might respond, get out of here. No way, man. You should have sought my help a long time ago before you got into this situation that you couldn't get yourself out of because of your own sin. But that's not how God responded. What does the text say in chapter 13, verses 4 and 5? It says, The Lord listened to them. Therefore the Lord gave Israel a Savior so that they escaped from the hand of the Syrians, and the people of Israel lived in their homes as formerly. Sometimes people get upset because they think there's so much wrath in the Old Testament. But really, there is so much mercy Mercy, 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 because look what happens next after God delivers Israel. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin, but walked in them, and the Asherah also remained in Samaria. When we are concerned as we look at the state of the world as to whether God will remain committed to his promise, we need to look at a story like this and remember just how merciful our God is. After Jehoaz dies, comes another descendant of Jehu, Jehu, Jehoash. He doesn't seem to be all that different from his father, though. He also did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin, but he walked in them. Even though he reigned for 16 years, that's pretty much all we need to know about him. He was wicked. Now, I said pretty much all we need to know about him because after summarizing his reign in just a couple verses in 14 through 19 the writer of kings selects one episode out of 16 years that he ruled over israel to illustrate what was really at the heart of his problem elisha became sick and was about to die and jehoash decided to go down and visit him and even cried when he sat with elisha my father my father the chariots of israel and its horsemen which sounds spiritual but the reality is he probably saw Elisha as a means of protecting Israel and for that reason is disappointed to see him go. Mercifully, God uses Elisha to give the king hope that they will achieve victory over Syria, which is probably what he's most concerned about. He has the king shoot an arrow out the window and then he describes that arrow as God's arrow of victory over Syria. So here's this king who's saying he's concerned about Elisha dying because he's frightened of what Syria would do, and God's encouraging him by saying that he will achieve victory, and the arrow represents victory. And it seems like having this set up, Elisha now wants to see how much God's promise means to the king. He says, take the arrow, which represents victory over Syria, and strike the ground with them, which seems strange to us, but the king had to see what was going on. Would he put his trust in God's word wholeheartedly? Was he passionate about God achieving victory for him and for Israel? Not, not really, <laughs> unfortunately. What does he do in verse 18? And how does the man of God respond and why? It says, and he struck three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you made an end of it. But now you'll strike down Syria only three times. And I, and I think the king knew exactly what he was doing. And that was why Elisha was angry. He knew that God wanted him to defeat Syria and make an end of them. And he was giving the king a chance to say that he agreed with God. But instead, through his actions, he basically only said, I, I sort of agree. I want Syria to stop bothering us, but I don't want an end of them. And who, who knows why? Politics, you know, there might have, there must have been some political motivation behind all this. But the point is, this is the king's problem. This is why he was such a mess. This is what you need to know about him. He didn't fully submit his will to the authority of the word of God. If we're worried about whether God will keep his promise, we need to read a story like this and see the problem is never with God. The problem has never been with God and his desire to keep his promise or his ability, but it's always been with man and whether or not they would fully embrace God's word and promises for themselves. And time after time, these kings didn't, which is again why the book of Kings is setting us up. We need a king whose heart is fully devoted to the promise of God. We need a descendant of David who will trust and obey.